Thanks for uh, that introduction. You know, I was the first one to meet Gus, and I'm, I'm going to still help Gus out right now. So Gus is like, what's a diadem? I was like, dude, you know what a diadem is? Everyone knows that. A diadem, let me just tell you what a diadem is. A diadem is a type of crown, specifically or, an ornamental headband worn by monarchs and others as a badge of royalty. The word derives from the Greek, I don't know if you knew that, Gus, band or fillet um, from I bind round or I fasten Wikipedia. Um, so that's what a diadem is. Everyone knows that, Gus, and um, now you are a part of everyone. So I'm still blessing Gus is what that really comes down to. And if nothing else, I feel like I've accomplished something this morning. Okay, I'm going to open by reading Psalm 29. The verses will not be on the screen. Just listen with me. It says this. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. The voice of the Lord spoke this world into existence. There was nothing. God spoke and creation followed. Let me pray. God, thank you that you are powerful and that you are mighty and that you are with us. May we have a glimpse of your power this morning. May we um, not only see your power, but see what that means for who you are and who we are as, as people made in your image. God, I pray, Lord, that you give all of us um, something to even do with this message, God, that we may just not hear this, myself included, but we may uh, hear your word and that we may be changed and we may be moved to action, both in thought and in um, how we treat others, how we, we see others and how we see this world. And so those are lofty prayers, God, but I believe you can do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, good morning. It is, it's good to be back at Common Way. Um, to be honest, it's not good to be back in this fashion, right? Um, because we're all probably less excited to be distanced, to uh, kind of go over, you know, go through everything we've gone through over the last nine months. But at least in, in part, it's good to be here and it's good to have a few folks here um, as well. Um, like many of you, I'm feeling stir crazy. I'm feeling more stir crazy than ever. Um, really, since November. All five of us, my wife and three kids, we've just been home. You know, we didn't have a ton of school in December. There was a lot of e-learning, and then our kids went back to school. Then one kid got quarantined, and then all the kids got quarantined, and then the school shut down. And then it's just like we are just all together on top of one another for the last really two months. And it's, it's tiring. And I don't know about you, I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling a little tired, a little weary this morning um, and not really even bad, but just again, just kind of going through the same cycles and uh, monotony and just desiring and longing for some sense of normalcy. And so I'm really excited that you guys are going to be meeting together here in a couple of weeks. That's super exciting and great, and I'm sure many of you are looking forward to that. Uh, but my topic this morning is not COVID fatigue. My topic this morning is God's power. And so God is powerful. God creates life. Uh, and he can take it away. God knows everything. The past and the future are his present. And there are endless examples of God's power in Scripture. One example is taken here from Exodus. This is a poem Moses writes after the parting of the Red Sea. And Moses says this. Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts he cast into the sea. And his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. Um, you guys just changed that verse for me. Thank you so much. I may be late on the verses, so thanks for that, but I'll keep reading. Um, the floods cover them. They wander down in the depths like stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. 
In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoils. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deed, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. And we see tons of places like that in Scripture, right? Where we see God's power, God's power over creation, God's power over nature. And God's power that he has, he's extended to you and I. All of us mark the fingerprint of God. And kind of one of the passages that describe this, um, that many of you probably know, happens in Genesis 1. People have called it the cultural mandate, and I'll just read it to you right now. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so that's the cultural mandate. Again, many of you are familiar with that. Bible commentator Kenneth Matthew points out, he says, human life alone is created in the image of God and has a special assignment to rule over the created order. And so you saw kind of the the mission given to God's people, given to Adam and Eve here in Genesis 1, but is extended to all of humanity, is to multiply, to rule, to subdue, to have dominion, words that often we don't use a lot in our language. Again, we're not the same as God, but we bear his image, his fingerprint is placed on humanity. And that gives every single person we encounter tremendous dignity because every single person reflects the image of God. We have power as human beings simply because we are made in his image. And so then on the very first pages of the Bible, we see power, we see flourishing and image bearing, all of those things connected that life is going to flourish And work at its best if God extends his power to you and I. Power is given to us for life to flourish. This fall, I was my six-year-old's soccer coach. And I was my six-year-old soccer coach because after the fourth email of them saying, we don't have enough soccer coaches, I gave in. And they, you know, I just thought, okay, first email, they'll find someone. Second email, fourth email, I was like, okay, I got to do it. And they said, you'll have an assistant. Because I was like, I don't know anything about soccer. And, um, and they're like, you'll have an assistant. It'll be fine. My assistant quit day one. Um, or she was fired. No, I'm just kidding. Her, her kid uh, just didn't like soccer. So she's like, well, I'm out. And, uh, but there are 10 kids on the team. And I had power as a coach. I had power because I had a shirt that said McDonald's. And uh, had said McDonald's really big, and it said coach on the back, so everyone knew it was purple. Um, and it displayed power, I guess. And I got to order these kids around. I took a page from one of my friends, and before every single practice, every single game, I made them huddle together. And I said, we got three team rules. And I made them repeat it, and they knew the rules by the end of uh, the time. Rule number one was have fun. Rule number two was no mistakes. Just kidding, that wasn't rule number two. Rule number two was actually be kind. Um, And then rule number three was maximum effort. And then I realized four-year-olds and five-year-olds didn't know what that meant, so I had to kind of explain to them what that meant, but by the end, they knew what maximum effort meant. That just meant we're going to try hard. And those have been my family rules ever since my kid uh, Lincoln was like five, and I was taking him to basketball, and I made him up on the way to his first practice. As, as coach, I had power, so I had to make sure each kid got equal playing time for them to have fun. Um, and really, my power was there for flourishing, because if I did not have power, and I was not the coach, these kids, they wouldn't have played a game. They would have been in the net. They would have fallen over. They would have turned on one another. It would have been unorganized, less fun, and not as good of an experience, and they would not have flourished. And I wouldn't say they flourished, but it, they wouldn't have flourished as much, at least. But power creates and shapes an environment where creatures can flourish. And image bearing is for power. For it's it's God's desire 
to fill the earth with representatives who have the same kind of dominion and rule over creation that he does. Unfortunately, very early in the story, humanity decided to use this power for evil. And before we look at how this power was corrupted, let me take a second to define power. I like the way Andy Crouch defines power. He does this in his book, Playing God, Redeeming the Gift of Power. He says, power is the ability to make something of this world. And what I love about that definition is power is a neutral thing. It's not good or bad or positive or negative. It's just our ability to make something of this world. And I think that really fits with the cultural mandate as well. As human beings, we can create some pretty incredible things. Um, We can... Uh, unravel DNA, we can um, send people in outer space, Uh, we can make tiramisu, um, which is really good, Um, yet we can create some really negative things. We can create nuclear weapons, we can create pornography, we can create those little circus peanuts um, that are sold in gas stations that are orange. God's given humanity the ability to make something of the world, and what we make of it can look drastically different. And so that's why I like Crouch's definition, and that's the one I'm going to go with. Um, But we were made in the image of God, and we have power, the ability to make something of this world, but this power was corrupted very early on in the story. In Genesis 3, we read about Adam and Eve and the fall and power being corrupted. That being under God was not enough for them. They wanted to be God themselves. Ed Stetzer does this really good four-part series in Christianity Today about pastors and abuses of power and power. And he says this. He says, the reality is that the fall happened, sin entered the world, power was abused, and the abusers come to power. And so now it's our disposition as fallen human beings to abuse power. And this has caused what Lord Acton famously said. You've probably heard this quote. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Frederick Nietzsche, he wrote a lot about power as a famous philosopher. And Nietzsche obviously was not a Christian, but he believed that all human beings wanted to be gods. And he said this, the natural human state was as one of the active flow of ceaselessly inventive power. And I believe Nietzsche understood something about people that we long and crave for power. And often that power is abused. My oldest son, Lincoln, he's 11 now, and that dude just loves power. He, he wants it, and he never gets it, too, which is kind of funny. Um, we were leaving, my wife and I, we were leaving to go on a walk with our dog, and he's at the age where we feel comfortable if we're running to the store, maybe, or if we're going on a walk and we're not gone very long, where we can leave him home alone. But the only problem is Lincoln has a nine-year-old and six-year-old sibling, and we trust him alone, but we don't trust him alone with his siblings because of him kind of raising up uh, his authority and power over them. We are leaving the house the other day, and we're just a couple days ago, and we're like, hey, we're leaving, guys. We're just going to go on a quick walk around the block. And I hear Lincoln yell at his siblings, I'm in charge. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is why you will never be in charge of your siblings. Um, your, your sister will babysit you before you babysit the others. But that is, I mean, we're not as vocal about that, but right, that's what happens to people with power. A lot of times we're longing for the position, and then when we get it, we're excited that we're in charge, and we get to tell others what to do. Okay, so to summarize where we've gone so far, number one, God is powerful. Number two, he's extended that power to us as being made in his image. And number three, that power has been corrupted. And so for the next part of the message, we're going to look at two things. One, as believers, we can overestimate our power. And number two, we can underestimate our power. And to look at how we overestimate our power, we're going to look at a story from 2 Kings. And let me read 2 Kings chapter 5, just verse 1. It says this, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by the Lord had given him victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Okay. Um, So we learn a lot about Naaman here in this first verse. Uh, Again, this verse takes place in the book of Kings. And if you've been reading the book of Kings, you know that this is a time in Israel's history where Israel is constantly rebelling against God. And is worshiping idols and is kind of doing their own thing. And this is about Syria, which Syria was the nation uh, directly north of Israel. And Israel found themselves constantly at odds with the nation of Syria at this time. 
Again, living in Syria is a guy by the name of Naaman, and we learn a lot about him from verse 1. We learn that he's a military commander, um, that he was a great man, um, that the king of Syria loved him because he was successful. We learn that he's a mighty man of valor. He had career and political success. We learn that he had money and he had honor and he had possessions and he had a really good resume. He really had achieved about as much as a person could achieve in those days. And many of us, that's where we find our strengths, right? This could be a whole other sermon, how we find our strengths and our achievements and in what we do. Murray Bell, she's a counselor, she says this, achievement is the alcohol of our times. But despite all of Naaman's achievements, we learn one more thing about him in this verse, and this is very important in that he was a leper. Despite all of his accomplishments, he was a dead man walking. Leprosy in the Bible encompassed various skin diseases that slowly crippled, disfigured, and eventually killed their victims. It would resonate back then like hearing a cancer diagnosis could resonate today. His body would swell, his bones would crack, and his skin would fall off. He had all the power and money and influence in the world. He should have been an insider, but his health made him an outsider. Okay, let's read on verses 2 through 5. I'm going to read right now. It says, Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord... With the prophet, or or, excuse me, would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. So Naaman went and told his Lord thus, and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Okay, we learned some other things from this passage, um, that when Israel and Syria were at war, the Syrians um, probably took a bunch of people, but one of the people they took was this girl, and this girl was in charge, uh, or was under the, the authority of Naaman's wife, um, his mistress, and one day they were talking, and she said, if only he was in Samaria, in Israel, there was this prophet there, where if you've been reading the book of uh, Second Kings, you know this prophet is Elisha. There's this prophet there. And if they met this prophet, then he probably could be healed. And so uh, he decides it's worth a shot. And so he heads to... Um, He heads to Israel, he takes a bunch of money, he's desperate, he takes silver and gold and clothing and heads hoping for a cure. Okay, let's read on verses um, 6 through 7. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? Only consider and how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Okay, so Naaman, he makes his way to Israel. He's got, he's got gold, he's got silver, he's got clothing, he's got this letter from the king that kind of says this is a person of power, this is a person of position, this is someone you should treat well. And he shows up to the king of Israel, and the king, he kind of thinks like, why are you coming to me? Why are you asking me this? Of course, I have no power to do this. Are you trying to start a war with us? Are you trying to ask me to do something that I obviously can't do? And I think it's interesting that when Naaman shows up and he's looking for this prophet, where does he go? He goes to the place of power. He goes to someone who is like him. He goes to someone who is in the same class, someone who has the same influence. But the king of Israel, despite all of of his power, was no help to Naaman. Okay, let's keep reading verses 8 through 12. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. Okay, that's seven. Now eight. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with the horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. 
But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farper the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Okay. So Elisha hears about the king tearing his clothes, and he wonders what's going on. He says, maybe this king, maybe he's thinking, maybe the king's repented from his idol worship. No, he realized that the king tears his clothes because this person, Naaman, has come to him asking him for something he couldn't do. And so Naaman comes and eventually finds Elisha. And he goes to Elisha's house, and Elisha does not come out to greet him, which he finds offensive. Naaman shows up with his impressive, powerful entourage of, of animals and goods. And again, Elisha doesn't even come out, but he sends his messenger. And I am sure, and we can get from our text here, that Naaman finds this insulting. Doesn't he know who I am? Doesn't he realize how powerful and prestigious I am? And he sends a servant to come and talk to me. I've gone all of this way to see him, and he won't even see me face to face. Not only that, he tells me to go wash in uh, the Jordan. And aren't, aren't the, the waters in Damascus and our land cleaner than the filthy Jordan in this land? And so he leaves in rage. He's furious at the response he gets from Elisha. He was furious because he couldn't control God. He couldn't give enough money to get what he wanted. So if Naaman was, is going to be healed in our story, it's going to be an act of grace. Let's read on verses 13 through 16. It says, But his servant came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman reluctantly follows his servant's instructions. The servant says, hey, you've come all this way. Why don't you just try it? Why don't you just see what this man of God, uh, if, he, if what he has to say is accurate? And so Naaman goes down to the Jordan. He bathes seven times. And Naaman has changed, not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. And we see this from our text. He goes back to Elisha, and he gets down from his horse, and he goes to greet Elisha, a sign of humility and honor. He's reverent, he's humble, he's generous. He has what seems to be some type of conversion experience, and he wants to give him all of the stuff he came with, but Elisha doesn't want any of that stuff and just tells him to go in peace. Okay. So that's our story from 2 Kings, but the question is, why tell this story? Well, this is a story of someone being healed, not by their own power, but by the grace of God. And isn't this how God heals all of us? Not by our own, our own power and effort, but by his grace. Naaman had money and prestige. He had position, but it got him nothing in the economy of God. And this leads me to the point that I'm trying to make is that we often can overestimate our own power when we base it in all the things that we have. Because what's really behind our desire for power? I think ultimately it's a desire to have control or at least those things are connected. We want power because we want to control things. We want to control our circumstances, our life, the people we're around. I mean, my son Lincoln, when he powers up in that moment, what does he want? He doesn't really want power. He wants to control his siblings and get them to do what he wants them to do. Naaman was the second most powerful person in the whole country of Syria, but he had no power to heal himself. And again, we can overestimate our power when we place it in our class, our wealth, our race, our prestige, our achievements. We can overestimate our power simply when we place it in ourselves. I'm sure each week, you know, COVID is brought up. It's something that we're kind of all walking through together as, as humanity, really. But COVID has made us want to control things, right? And it's really fought against that because we have so little control on, on, on most things. And so I don't even know how we've tried to control things during COVID, right? 
Maybe it's getting our houses in order. Maybe it's like doing all the right things. Maybe for some people, it's just gathering as much information, like knowledge is power. So if I have every bit of knowledge on COVID and when it's going to end and what I need to do, then I will be able to assert some type of control over it. And yet the pandemic has robbed us from probably most of the control and power we thought we had to begin with. You know, we've, we've thought, I, I would imagine, a little bit about power this week as we had the inauguration on Wednesday. We saw a peaceful transfer of power this week, which was great. And I am hopeful and pray for our new leaders. Um, but, but now many of us can place our hope in that and say, okay, now that we have a new administration with new power, then that's going to change this country. Um, or, but at the end of the day, there's no presidency that has the power to change what's really going on in people's hearts. And so we can overestimate power. We can overestimate our own power. We can overestimate the power in our leaders. While at the same time, we can also underestimate power. We can underestimate the power that God has given us as his followers. And in order to kind of communicate this, I'm going to just read a ton of verses kind of in this section because I think it really communicates it better than I can. So Uh, This is a familiar verse to you, but this is um, uh, Jesus, the book of Acts, right before he ascends. He says this to his disciples, and I think he would say it to us today. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and in the end of the earth. In a similar vein, Paul says to Timothy in his second letter to him, he says, for God gave us what? A spirit, uh, not of fear, but of power, of love and self-discipline. And so as Christians, we have the spirit of God that lives inside of us, which is a spirit of tremendous power. It's the same spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20 talks about this. It says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he who worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And so the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power through his spirit, through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Later on in that same letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul says this, Now to him who was able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That God's power that works in us is able to do immeasurably more than all we can imagine or ask for. Moses in the Old Testament is quick to remind the Israelites where their power for victory and success really comes from. I love this passage here in Deuteronomy 8. Moses says this, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I commanded you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, And when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Beware lest you say in your hearts, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. And so Moses is saying, yeah, when you find success, and believes that the Israelites will find success, you need to remember where that comes from. And it's easy for us to forget and to believe that it comes from us and our achievements and our intelligence and our our work ethic. And yet it comes from the Lord. And so we can overestimate our power when we place it in ourselves. And I think we can underestimate our power, the, the mighty power that lives inside of us as believers through his spirit. And so what does it look like when power is lived the right way? We have a ton of bad examples, right? Power has been talked about a ton in in media and and power in Hollywood, right? Power in the church, power in uh, work dynamics, and and power with, with racial issues. Again, there's tons of conversations around this topic right now. But what could real power actually look like? If power is something neutral, then what can power look like when it's used for good? Well, we're in church, so it's, it's, it's kind of simple. To some degree, power looks like Jesus. Jesus was God, yet he emptied himself of his power to become a human being. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 describes this. It says, have this in mind among yourselves. So imitate this, Paul's saying, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. 
being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Again, Jesus emptied himself. He did not give up his power. Rather, he showed us what real power looks like when it's used correctly. Another great example of this, we're not going to look at the text. Um, Many of you know the story in John 13. It's a story of John's account of the Last Supper. And Jesus' disciples, they've, they've had a long day, and they're going to have, they're going to eat a meal together, and they arrive in the upper room, and all their feet are dirty, and there's no host or servant to wash their feet. And they all look at each other, kind of wondering, who's going to wash uh, our feet? Because our feet are dirty and it needs washing, and no one takes initiative. And then Jesus steps up, and Jesus washes their feet and shows them what power really looks like. I like what Andy Crouch uh, says. He describes it this way. He says, we remember the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet in the upper room as a story of humility and servanthood, which is entirely true. We often retell that story as if it involves Jesus giving up power, as if power were the opposite of humility and servanthood. And I think that's a really good example. It's not the giving up of power, but it's showing us what real power actually looks like. He gives leaders and pastors and um, really all of us, again, if we're all made in the image of God, then we all have power. So we all have some leadership, right? He really gives us all an example of what power really looks like. And, And power is used to serve. John Stott says this, speaking of leaders, he says, leaders have power, but power is safe only in the hands of those who humble themselves to serve. Again, if we go back to that silly soccer example of me with the kids, if, if my goal was to really control them and to power up, again, it was helpful for me to be there because I used some of my power and influence to create some organization. But at the same time, my power was very limited because kids were still falling in the net. There's still one kid who was always talking to me about rainbows. And I'm like, dude, you should be playing. And he always, he always wanted to be in. He never wanted to sit on the bench, but he never wanted to kick a soccer ball. So, you know, there was a struggle there. And so there were still those things going on, right? Like I didn't have all the power in that moment. But I was only able to thrive as a coach if my mindset wasn't to have power over these kids. But I am showing up to serve and do what little I can to help them flourish and have a better experience playing. Okay, so where have we gone We've gone that God is powerful. God extends that power to you and I. Power is ultimately neutral, but power has been corrupted with sin entering the story. We've seen that we can overestimate our power when we place it in our stuff, our achievements. When we place it in ourselves, we can underestimate our power that we have as Christians, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And we can see that that power is practiced perfectly in the life of Jesus. And this is a life that is marked by service and a life that is marked by sacrifice. Christian uh, leader Ed Stetzer, he gives this encouragement. And um, as I begin to close, I'll, I'll share this. It says, when people misunderstand where power comes from, they will misappropriate the use of power. If people think they are the ones who earn or work for power according to who they are and what they did, they will use power for their own benefit, regardless of its effect on others. However, if people believe the power they possess was a gift, they'll come to see power as something they steward for the good of the one who graciously gave them this gift. Okay, so each of us has given, been given this command to rule, to have dominion, to have authority over God's created order. And this is a gift that we are given from God. And so the question is, what are we going to do with this gift? Are we going to use it to control, to manipulate others? Are we going to pretend like it doesn't exist, like we actually don't have it? Because that's actually not helpful either. Or are we going to use it to serve and lay down our lives and sacrifice for those around us? I think one question for us to ask as we close is, who are you in charge of this week? Um, It probably doesn't matter what age you are. If you're watching this at 12 and you have younger siblings and you probably have some power dynamics over them. Um, If if you're a college student, there's probably peers. There's group projects. If you're a parent, obviously kids, obviously with work. There's employees and managers and, and power dynamics kind of all around us. But so when you enter into those places... How are you going to enter them this week? Are you going to enter them with the mindset of Christ that I'm here to serve and lay down my life? And so that's, that's my hope. That's my hope for my life this week as well. And so let me pray, and then we'll continue on. Jesus, I thank you that you have given us your spirit. Thank you that you've given us not a spirit of timidity, but one a power of love and self-discipline. Thank you, God, that your spirit lives inside of us. 
So God, I just pray, Lord, that that spirit comes out, that the fruits of the spirit come out in our life this week. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. God, help us not um, run from the power that you've given us, but God, help us steward it well. Help us see for places where we can serve and help your creation flourish and thrive. And obviously, we need your help to do this. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, for worshiping with us um, this morning. And uh, I look forward to the day where I get to do this again and all you guys are here in the audience and uh, you guys have a great week.